Vietnam to understand, and first to visualize, and then to understand the decay process of that structure as well. <clears throat> All this before, even before thinking to do a restoration, even before trying to draft uh, just a, a, a restoration project. Well, unfortunately, that is not done yet. And we are close enough if we were to say, OK, let's, let's move in and let's put all the, the knowledge and the, the different fields that we could apply and different methodologies and also uh, different technologies, <clears throat> then we will make it. It's, uh, the science needed is all there. We have to reassess it. We have to re-engineer. We have to, re, uh, to establish, talking about methodologies, a proper methodology, how to study a work of art or a cultural heritage uh, um, object of any, of any type. Then there are many other issues that I could go on and on, like uh, dating, like uh, authentication, uh, um, like even making a forecast, a visual forecast of what a work of art, how a work of art will look like, let's say, in 20 years, if the decay process continues the way it is, if the rate of decay is the same, if placed in the environment where it is today, what will happen in 10 years, in 20 years, and show this so that politicians all over the world, may, maybe, maybe, uh, they will be a little more concerned and um, they will see that we are actually in this 50, 60 years time, we have done more damage to our world cultural heritage than perhaps in the last three centuries, and the rate of decay is accelerating. And who is there to fight this war? Art historians and restorers. Believe me, there is no match. <clears throat> so it is challenging in a way. It's worthwhile, by the way, because we are talking about our cultural heritage worldwide. This is not you know, an experiment. This is not something just interesting. This is something that we will do for our past and for our future, because that's what we should rely on. But we have to fight this. This uh, uh, we have to be aware that this indeed is something that it needs way much more than art historians and restorers, and frankly, way much more than just our architects specialized in restorations. I'm facing on, on a daily basis. Uh, damages done uh, by uh, engineers and restorers that not because they are not competent in what they're doing, but they don't have the objective knowledge of what has happened to a monument to, uh, that uh, through the centuries. So it's a, it's a um, fair guess, um, but that's all there is. It's not an objective, complete understanding. And as a result, while you're uh, making this intervention, you find out a lot of things that you could not imagine were there, a lot of facts that you could not have seen before, and several times it's just too late to do anything about it. So just take this as a, an invitation to think about how much uh, science could do, and I'm sure each of you uh, in his own field could say, hey, but we could try this, hey, but I think this can be done in another way. Uh, so this is, uh, in a way, it's uh, not provocative, but in once the sequence of images of examples that I'm going to show you must be um, just uh, an invitation to realize how much can be done, what is being done up to now, more or less. This is just a very brief introduction, <clears throat> but it's a panorama on, uh, from art and architecture. I didn't put in um, archaeology <clears throat> this time, but it goes just as well. And at the end, we'll see a little a more in depth uh, the study and the methodology used to study a work by Leonardo, which, by the way, uh, is the Adoration of Magi, by which um, we can talk about the code in Da Vinci now because. Uh, God knows what I've done, simply because Dan Brown, one day, reading an article in the, um, um, in the um, New York Times uh, magazine, uh, he uh, that was talking about what I've done, I, I did um, in the year 2001-2002 on the adoration and the discovery that were made, uh, he thought that this was uh, a good subject for his uh, book uh, because it added some mystery, some you know, special esoteric uh, uh, thoughts, uh, and which you know follow through very well in his book. Uh, 
So I find myself in, in, uh, in this book with no understanding that I was going to put in. I never met uh, Dan Brown. I never talked to him, by the way. <clears throat> and it was all his initiative. And I, was, I, re I got a call from, uh, from Washington one day uh, from a friend of mine saying, you know, you knew, do you know that you are in this book? And they didn't have any idea whatsoever. And now it seems that uh, since the movie is coming, <clears throat> so now they realize, hey, the only true character in, the, in this fiction book is this guy, which, I mean, uh, I didn't do anything on the book for the book. Uh, but now it seems that since everybody is, or the media, not everybody, let's say the media, it's uh, pushing to make it such a big deal um, and a big business, by the way, um, you know, they, they are searching for truth and untruth, which in a way uh, it's useless, in my opinion, because it's a fiction book. So let's stop making such a big deal. When you read a, a fiction book, whatever is there, take it as a fiction. And uh, Stop it there. Um, but we have to speculate. We have to, you know, because this has become a business. You know, well, it's understandable to the point, but it's not understandable that based on reading a fiction book, you say, okay, now from now on, I'm not a, I doubt if I am a, <clears throat> a Christian or a, a, a Catholic because this guy says that, uh, you know, Jesus might have, uh, um, was married or whatever else uh, is in this book. Frankly, I mean, if our, quote unquote, our beliefs, our faith is so weak that a fiction book can uh, sort of uh, push you out of the path, then uh, maybe the ground is already ripe, then any book or anything could, uh, could drive you out of, uh, of your faith or your beliefs, uh, regardless if they are true or not. That's another problem. But it's not with the fiction that you solve the problem. So that's as much as I can say about this book and my presence in this book. <clears throat> and frankly, objectively speaking, I mean, uh, I think we, we should uh, um, not contribute anymore uh, to pump in uh, so much interest and for some guys, which means a lot of more money, okay? <clears throat> there are better cause, causes uh, worth it uh, uh, to uh, receive attention and uh, money <clears throat> than this. And, worse problems in the world than just to worry about uh, if this guy is, try, is, is right or wrong. <clears throat> this guy was a smart guy, and very much smart, so he has used a lot of uh, right uh, ingredients to make an explosive recipe. Okay, good for him, but let's not help him to make even more money, uh, adding uh, questions and wonders and doubts. Uh, uh, it's improper. That's, that's all I can say. Okay, let's move in and let's see some of these applications. I will start from the uh, simplest, if you wish, but still very intriguing um, methods of investigation of works of art. So let's take a detail of a painting of 16th century, early 16th century painting uh, at the Uffizi, <clears throat> attributed once to Leonardo and then to other guys, which is normal, by the way. Changing attribution is just the rule of the game. Uh, continuously, which tell you, we should tell you something in terms of uh, objectivity, um, but that's another story. Now, in the lower uh, image, you see the um, what is called the ultraviolet fluorescence image of the same painting, just shining an ultraviolet, uh, some ultraviolet light on it, and just uh, putting a filter to cut off the, the reflector UV light. And just either you can use a normal uh, uh, film color uh, film or just use a, a digital camera. It will, will just work fine. And as you see, all these blue areas, they just represent all the retouching. Now, the reason why I show this is because how many, how many times we are deceived by our eyes thinking that what we are looking at, it's, you know, it's real, it's uh, untouched, uh, uh, undamaged. <clears throat> well, this is the least. Uh, that uh, we should be entitled to know when we go and s in a museum and we see a work of art, or we go in a gallery and we see a work of art, or we try to buy a painting, and we are always told that that is absolutely perfect, it had never been touched by a coincidence that we always pick up the, the, the painting that has never been touched or restored. So there are simple ways, to, at least to double check, at least on the surface, what might have happened. Another case like, I mean, these are important paintings. This is a Raphael, and you can see how indeed, um, well, it, it, there is a pathology here, so to speak. And the pathology is due to uh, uh, woodworms that have eaten up uh, the, wood, the wood support underneath, and finally they, 
once they, they managed to come to the surface, uh, they eaten up the last part of uh, the, the wood uh, and, uh, and the painting, and then they turned into the fly and flew away. And uh, to fill in these voids and then to retouch it, as a result, in UV, you will see all these dark areas and they appear more or less round. <clears throat> or take the spring by Botticelli, okay? Uh, you will see a detail of the mercury face in the visible light that before restoration. And on the left-hand side, you'll see the UV fluorescence before and after restoration. The green uh, uh, dominant, uh, let's say, of, um, that is, sits on the surface of a uh, of the left hand uh, <clears throat> image is due to the fluorescence of, um, of a varnish, of a more or less a photo oxidized varnish. And on the right hand side, that was re part, mostly removed. And you see this sort of a blue, uh, dark gray blue stripes, which are the results of a strong solvent that was brushed on this, the, the face of, um, of mercury and uh, eaten up uh, the, uh, the binding media. And so it dissolving the, as, as, a, as a result um, the color, the pigment of the flesh. So what you see is the, as a gray fluorescence is the fluorescence of the gesso ground under uh, the flesh layer, meaning that uh, a damage was done previously because you still see these uh, this, um, uh, lines <clears throat> before restoration. But you might see that under uh, on the neck and on the chin, uh, this area, this gray area, it's wider, bigger, because in the cleanup of uh, mo removing the, uh, the varnish, uh, some uh, of the original paint was removed as well. So this is, uh, if you want, it's qualitative uh, imaging. Nevertheless, I mean, therefore, information. But it's still an objective way to say, hey, the, a, da a damage was done. Then radiography. Okay, radiography is nothing, nothing new. By the way, <clears throat> the the level of technology for uh, radiology applied to works of art is still the same as 50 years ago, to say the least. Um, there are some uh, portable units, but just done, made for non-destructive testing. Uh, hardly you will find something specifically made for uh, taking X-rays of. Um, uh, statue, wood statues rather than uh, paintings on canvas and on wood. And that is something to think about. There is because there is a lot that we could do, a lot we, can, we could improve in the re engineering of this technique and also uh, to in, introduce also the, a, a, a digital radiography. Um, I give you an example of the many uh, hundreds. I, uh, by now, I went over 18,000 uh, x rays, uh, so I. I mean, I've seen just about everything uh, with, with x-rays uh, under uh, paint layers. Uh, a Raphael painting here shows the unicorn on the left-hand side, and the x-ray image shows a dog. Um, far the exams um, show that not even the dog was there in the first place. Uh, in, in this case, uh, the cross-section analysis uh, uh, help us to determine that. <clears throat> and furthermore, the painting was unfinished totally, uh, up to practically the waistline. So this was, it is, still is, an icon in, the, in, the, in art history. And uh, you know, you can just go through these books and uh, see that uh, everything is considered authentic by Raphael. And, uh, and this is not introduced as uh, an objective fact to change uh, what we know about the iconography, and therefore the iconology is specifically uh, of this painting. <clears throat> but also for, for conservation purposes. You might see these uh, long uh, white lines, they're just nails to fix pieces uh, of the many that um, uh, when the painting um, <clears throat> was uh, under a, 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 a house that uh, collapsed because of an earthquake. And uh, they just used long nails, nails uh, to put the pieces together and a large piece down here on the left-hand side um, was totally replaced and shows, therefore, a different radio opacity. Um, furthermore, um, which, by the way, has never been done, or hardly, <clears throat> I mean, in, in 30 years I've done it twice, take the x-ray again after a certain number of years to compare what, for example, of the many reasons, uh, what the... Um, uh, the, the woodworms have done to the, to the support. 
And this is the result. All these uh, black lines are just warm, uh, warmed tunnels. So by the hundreds and hundreds. Now, how could you compare? How could you figure out if there is uh, still an activity going on of these woodworm, woodworms? Well, if you were just to subtract the two, you might find that, uh, for example, in 1983, you could even, you could even see uh, the worm. Uh, and uh, obviously, later on, uh, this little guy find his way out. I mean, this is just a very simple way to compare <clears throat> and, to make and to have an understanding of what really is going on if, indeed, uh, the, the wood support is under an attack, as we said, uh, uh, by woodworms. Take a, there are many, many other applications of x-rays, naturally, but uh, for one thing, we can even see uh, the way the artist um, <clears throat> has used the brush, or instead of the brush, the fingers. And therefore, he leaves fingerprints on the painting. Now, I don't know how much you can see. Well, I thought a little more, more than that. But anyway, believe me, this, all this uh, figure of Christ, uh, they, they, this, uh, the flesh that is so uh, much radio opaque is because there's a lot of uh, um, uh, paint uh, with um, biaca, we say, uh, it's uh, lead carbonate, um, reworked with fingers, okay? So there are fingerprints just about everywhere. And we're talking a painting by Verrocchio, the master of Leonardo and Leonardo. <clears throat> Incidentally, I found fingerprints of Leonardo in the three Leonardo da Vinci's painting that I've studied so far. And sooner or later, I'll find a way to, well, to compare them. <clears throat> Raphael is the same. Uh, other other artists uh, was quite straightforward to use their fingerprints to to model, uh, to give that the very fine finishing on the of the surface. Now, infrared reflectog reflectography. Now we work uh, with a with a camera. It could be a, a Vidicon tube uh, with a spectral response up to 2.2 uh, microns, or we can use uh, CCDs. We can use uh, um, all sorts of uh, um, other <clears throat> um, sensor devices. Uh, um, as long as uh, we work in the spectral range between one and two microns, we can go through, actually we can see through layers of paint. Uh, this is a camera that I built uh, many years ago and uh, has worked just fine uh, on just about uh, all sorts of different uh, 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 structure layers <clears throat> of paint, and, and naturally there are, well, there are a lot of things that needs to be said, but I, I would like to show you some application. For one thing here, you see a painting, and in the lower part, just focus on this area here, the, the possibility to have in real time an image of what is underneath. Um, it gives you, in this case, the revelation that there is a, uh, not only the name of the artist, but where he also made the painting in Roma in 1655, uh, uh, the 10th of July. So, I mean, uh, it's a way to screen, to, to do a, a good screening of, uh, of the painting uh, to uh, search in search of um, uh, inscriptions, numbers, signature, as well as state of conservation, restoration, um, or losses. Let's move on to another, uh, or to see another example. But since we go through all the paint layers, we come to a point where uh, the infrared radiation that we are sending on the painting, and then the, uh, the sensor device uh, uh, um, transform the, the reflected infrared rays uh, in a, into an in image. Uh, this infrared rays that we are sending in, it comes to a moment where it reaches the, the surface of the preparation layer, the ground layer. Well, then it's being reflected or is being absorbed. If there is another drawing, let's say made with charcoal, the charcoal lines will absorb the infrared. And, um, and the, the difference in reflection between uh, the part of the infrared uh, light that we have sent in uh, reflected and the part that's been absorbed by the, the, um, the lines of the um, drawn with charcoal will, uh, will, enable us, will enable us to see the under drawing. You see those lines on the right hand side? I will see it better now here. That is the preparatory drawing, lines that the artist drew before starting to paint. That's where he sort of uh, either transposed a, a drawing already made on paper, and then in that case you will have uh, <clears throat> more or less obviously the same uh, um, ratio, the same uh, size, or he actually um, many times he could draw directly on the ground, and that 
means that you could see the artist at work, the moment of creativity, the real creativity right there. Otherwise, your eyes would not be able, obviously, to penetrate through. Uh, take the last uh, supper of the many problems of the many, many battles that I tried to fight, and I, I must say, most of them I lost, frankly, and this is one. Uh, when I tried to not to allow the restoration to be done because there was not enough knowledge about what needed to be done, not enough knowledge of the decay processes, not enough knowledge above all what was original and how can you tell and what was not done by Leonardo and was added later. For 20 years, all this was left up to one person to judge with his own eyes, actually her eyes, uh, what to do, what to leave, and what to remove. And I think that is uh, not just because it's the Last Supper, but it's indicative that the methodology is totally subjective. There is no science applied. There is no objective way to prove. Just the decision of one guy, his eyes, his experience, day after day for 20 years. So what do we see today? What is this image all about? Well, it's still the Last Supper, but it's the interpretation of that person that, and from now on, that's what we get. There's nothing else we can do now. I tried and I lost to not only to prevent and then to stop so that in order to leave, to give science a chance to determine first if it was worth it the risk, second if indeed we could establish what was Leonardo what was not, um, at least try. Give you an example. This is what the surface looked like <clears throat> before the restoration. It's, you can see it's very damaged, it's very heterogeneous, it's very dirty. Now pretending that just using your eyes only and your experience and a solvent, by the way, and a scalpel, uh, then you can determine not only what is right or what, what is not by Leonardo, but also to which extent you remove, when you should stop. Uh, all this, if you transform this, if you place this into a surgery, uh, let's say environment, a real medicine, medical surgery, I mean, the surgeon will be thrown to jail or definitely will be uh, put in a, in a position not to do any more damage to the patient uh, or to leave a, a, a surgeon alone with no background, no backup whatsoever of a clinical chart of a, a scientific or diagnostic investigation done pre previously. This is what is being done systematically. Not, this is not an exception, by the way. This is the rule, talking about methodology. And many times, not because, don't get me wrong, not because restorers are, you know, uh, so irresponsible at all. They, they do their best. They try their best. They are aware of their limitation. They are, but, and at the same time, though, uh, many times they don't have any science to back them up. They don't have any, any support. They don't have any financial support as well. And so they are left alone, and they try their best. So it's not a war against someone. Don't get me wrong. It just is the method which is totally wrong, and where is the science? Give you an idea. Infrared pseudocolor photography or imaging, whatever. Now you can do it with a, with a, a digital camera just as easy. Uh, see the robe of the apostle here, which is blue in the visible light. In the pseudocolor infrared, it becomes red and blue because the part red was, was painted with lapis lazuli and the part that remains blue in the pseudocolor infrared uh, imaging was painted with uh, azurite. Now, that is a clue. It's just an indication. Uh, Sometimes it's uh, good enough to get an idea of the color uh, identity. On the other hand, that should tell you that, okay, uh, what is real, what is authentic, what is not. Uh, at least you get a clue and then you move on. You do other tests. Same is for, let's say, the robe of the Annunciation by Leonardo. <clears throat> uh, you can immediately have a good idea that that indeed is, was painted with, uh, with lapis lazuli. And um, also cinnabar, which turns into yellow. Um, and this is uh, the, this yellow here, it's a, an earth color that usually turns into blue and so forth. So you get a sort of a color coding. It's not enough. It's an indication. And then you move on and, and possibly uh, establish that an area was done with a certain color, even if you're not sure, then you just do a point analysis in that area with the same coloring, uh, color rendering, 
and it becomes objective and valid for the entire surface, whatever the outcome of the pigment identification will be. Now let's try to match at least three wavelengths, the visible, the UV fluorescence, the X-ray, uh, to solve uh, and to make the, the restorer in a position to solve problems that he's facing every day. That is, okay, you see a restoration, sometime you better see it better, and that's where the UV fluorescence can help you, or the infrared reflectography as we've seen before. And then, but what is underneath? If I remove this restoration, what do I find? Do I find a paint loss? or it's, uh, it's simply a retouching over, a reinforcing the original color. If you take the x-ray, this black area shows that it's the total loss because uh, the, the, uh, the film in this case became darker because there's no absorption, x-ray absorption right there uh, as a result. All this brings to a very simple uh, principle that for you and in the medical field, even more is straightforward. We need a, uh, to collect all as much as we know about uh, the, the patient, because that's what we should talk about. When we go in a museum, we should remember that it's not only a very beautiful place where we see masterpieces, it's a, it's a, it's a hospital. It's truly a hospital with all these patients. Very old, very delicate, by the way. Uh, and we should know that whatever we do, even the fact that we are there, we interfere with the microclimate around the painting. Uh, and there is a lot, way much more that should be done than just position uh, a, a, um, or make measurements uh, for uh, humidity, um, relative humidity of temperature of the environment. I mean, let's face it, if we were to go in a hospital and uh, enter in a room and we will see a, a, uh, some temperature um, measurements uh, and relative humidity measurements made of the room, that's fine. But what about the patient? Who is measuring the fever to the patient? Uh, that is still to come, okay, as a concept. So we, they worry just for the environment, but what about the patient? What is the reaction to the environment of the patient? Uh, how long does it take um, if there is a change in temperature humidity in that environment? What is the relationship in terms of also time? All these are issues that are way far from being answered. Where is the technology, by the way? Um, so a clinical chart that I tried to present, I've done it only once uh, because then uh, it was considered to, uh, I don't even remember the name that I was told, but let's say it didn't work, okay? <clears throat> but at least I know, I tried once uh, to show the anatomy because that's the problem. The first step to, under, uh, to study a work of art is to establish the anatomy. We know nothing about the anatomy. For us, it's an alien. Uh, what is made of, how was made, so technique, materials, and then you can establish what is the state of conservation, there is, what is the pathology, where is the pathology, what type of pathology, and then you can do the dating, and then uh, also you need an anamnesis. There is the history of what happened to the patient. It sounds all straightforward. Do you think this is done? You can find me a museum in the world that has clinical charts for, for the works of art on display. It doesn't happen yet. It should, it might. So that gives you an idea how much is there to be done. Um, you can do something on, uh, on statues of any type, uh, marble, stone, rather than, uh, than wood. Uh, well, you'd be surprised how, how even the most important uh, masterpieces like uh, you know, the David by Michelangelo, as the surface has been uh, altered, changing from calcium, sulf uh, calcium carbonate to calcium sulfate. Um, just bringing in uh, pollution, bringing in uh, humidity by the something like uh, 800,000 people uh, in a relatively small museum uh, where the David is located. It's an incredible amount of stuff that is brought on the surface, which is, by the way, a very cold surface and even more so, so the, you have um, problems with, uh, with humidity even more. <clears throat> Uh, UV fluorescence just can tell you what, what has been done, uh, the, the damage done by, by rain, acid rains, that they done, or the presence of uh, some organic stuff being brushed on to protect the surface, as the uh, very bright fluorescence will indicate to you. Okay, let's move on to architecture and uh, see what um, a laser scanner can do in, in architecture. It has been a, a revolution in the last five, six years. Now, hardly you will find uh, uh, people just measuring by hand, um, especially if it's a big monument or a very elaborate uh, facade. 
So when we had to study and we have to make the blueprint of uh, Palazzo Vecchio, one of the, well, oldest, most important, but also biggest uh, uh, buildings we have in Florence, it would have been uh, impossible just to go and measure each single stone, um, as well as this was necessary to establish uh, the exact geometric uh, rendering and make a 3D model as well uh, of this uh, building when uh, we were searching, we still do, uh, the, um, uh, where the, the, uh, the famous uh, um, masterpiece by, by, by Leonardo de Bello Vanghiari, a mural painting, uh, was, um, was done, was painted, and then if it's still there. Uh, in the whole of the 500, we might see a few images there. So you just shine a, a laser beam, <clears throat> and just uh, with the time of flight uh, that it takes uh, from, uh, for the laser beam to, uh, to hit the target and come back, then you establish the time, and then you establish the distance, uh, knowing, obviously, the, the speed of light. And that is a, it's a pulse laser that does, uh, does it in a, you know, very fast and can collect uh, 300,000 uh, points uh, in a... Uh, roughly anywhere between two and four minutes. Now I understand there is a higher speed and the precision is in the order of uh, a centimeter at just uh, between uh, 50 and 60 meters distance. So uh, it's very reliable in other words. Uh, this is Palazzo Vecchio by the way, that's uh, a very uh, impressive buildings and it would have been just impossible. It would have taken years and years and extremely higher cost. And that's the blueprint that you get. Um, well, there are several phases that are skipped. I don't have here the time to just show you. Uh, once you get the points, the clouds of points, then you register the clouds of points, then you go to a mesh of polygons, and from the mesh of poly polygons, you create a grid. Uh, that grid is your structure, is your skeleton, on top of which you can put any rendering or you can put real uh, imaging. Uh, and that is the first step to establish not only the real view, the real understanding, the visual understanding of, the, of uh, each um, wall, each uh, uh, facade, but also to, uh, you know, that is on, a, uh, on a, a, a real geometric model. So you can take measurement as well as you can then paste on other images done with other wavelength and then fade in and out to establish what, uh, what happened to uh, that part of the, of the building. Uh, and that gave me the possibility to establish how was the whole the 500 um, in uh, in 1507 and how it, it is today. This is the whole the 500, a huge building with a lot of rooms uh, built up uh, on on the west side, which is this wall over here. And in red um, and in, in blue, uh, you can see how uh, it took a couple of years, but we managed to establish how really it was and uh, compare to the today state. And then uh, from there, with, many, with several other exams, we were able to establish that Leonardo painted his mural on the right-hand side of the east wall, which is the west wall, sorry, east wall, which is the one that it's, you will be facing if you walk in the whole the 500 today. Now, the next step will be what, what happened to the Bell of Anghiari once we have established where it was painted. And this is uh, hopefully something we, we will start working very soon <clears throat> using, uh, well, we have used lay, um, uh, radar, um, as you will see, but also we should use something more, more specific to determine if there are some pigments left hidden by, uh, behind a wall set up by Vasari, possibly to cover and to protect the Battle of Anghiari. <clears throat> Thermography, it's incredibly useful. Um, you'll be, I mean, it's surprising for me after 30 years that I've been, well, I've been using it uh, on architecture and museum environments um, to find out that so little has been done uh, or so little has been used. <clears throat> so here you have a, just a very small compact camera uh, operating Ideally, for architecture, is between uh, six and ten microns uh, peak, with a peak more or less uh, between eight and nine microns, and just uh, visualizing the thermal distribution on the surface. Okay, just viewing the thermal distribution of the surface and the changes in the thermal distribution, you can actually see, recognize the structure of the wall covered by a layer of plaster. Each uh, single piece of the wall 
each single piece of the structure, stone, brick, whatever, they have a different thermal capacity. <clears throat> and they release this heat that being absorbed in, with different time. So let's take it as, a, as well, what it is really, it's, a <clears throat> it's heat released in, a, in all directions, obviously, but the part that goes uh, in the direction of the, of the plaster, then it's like sh projecting a, a, a shadow of the, of the geometry. Well, it's worth it, the image, as usual, a thousand words. <clears throat> so here, you actually see each single brick as a projection of heat on the surface of the plaster. So in real time, you see the structure <clears throat> without touching anything. See this? You see the chimney, the, these two chimneys here, hidden behind the, plaster, the painted plaster. In this case, there is a, it's a fresco. It would be unthinkable just to take it down, just to see what is the structure of the, of the, of the wall. Uh, another one, <clears throat> see here, for example, you see a, a door with the stone frame still around it. Okay, so it's all, it, it's incredibly useful to be able to see in real time this structure without touching anything, even at a distance. See this, uh, this is a layout of the 16th century of this courtyard of Palazzo Vecchio. <clears throat> and here you see uh, the several windows that have been filled in. There are over 12 uh, of the original uh, layout uh, of the 13th century. So you actually see the history of architecture before your eyes, and it is actualized. In other words, what you see, it's, a, it's more reliable than any drawing you could find, any document you could find, because it's in that moment. That's the information updated to that moment. Or for even a modern structure, see the, the, all the um, concrete, uh, reinforced concrete the beams, and this is essential. Uh, imaging, in my opinion, in any area where, uh, well, there's a sis seismic uh, problem. And Italy is very much at, at risk in that sense. <clears throat> so you would expect uh, just to go house by house and do a thermal mapping, thermal imaging of every house to understand the structure. And once you know the structure, you can measure a single element with a precision more or less of an inch, believe me. And then you can apply all sorts of analysis, uh, finite elements analysis, uh, stress analysis, because you actually see the elements. How many times you apply finite elements analysis uh, making a guess? Or you even can discover an entire building under, uh, like here. You see, there is a, uh, this is a gray area with two oblique lines, diagonal lines. Indeed, they show um, one full building engulfed, and which is a church right here. I go back. This is the church, and this is our windows that have been opened later, breaking up uh, the original uh, wall. And in a 18th century uh, painting, you can see the whole church right there. All right, so we move into the whole of 500. That to give you the just a fair idea of how immense this building is. Uh, this hall is. Just imagine to go inside and say, okay, today I want to find out without touching anything if Leonardo, uh, most important uh, masterpiece, the Bello Vangari, is still there. Uh, where is the science? Huh? I mean, you cannot just go and just uh, hammer down anything. <clears throat> so it has been, to say the least, a big, big challenge. Um, I'll give you an idea of thermal imaging of the ceiling. You see all the wood beams uh, clearly shown, and how, what else could you do? Uh, how else could you do it? You're not going to make an X-ray of a of a ceiling of a of a of a hole like this. It would take a, you know not only an immense amount of money, but also you just get it right away, and not only you get <clears throat> the visualization of the beams of the wood beams, but also the layout, and also you can measure the thickness. Also, the ceiling here, it might not be so clear for you, but we have uh, many uh, ceilings that uh, uh, they are made of uh, uh, canes. Uh, does it make any sense if I say canes? Canne? Anyway, um, it's, um, th there are some uh, uh, pieces of wood, let's say, not exactly structured, that are nailed to 
uh, a, a regular would be structure of the ceiling, and, and then plaster is being attached to this uh, irregular fragments of wood. What? Lath. Lath. Grazie. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I didn't find that in the dictionary, so I. Yes, lath and plaster. Thank you. And so this is clearly shown as this white image here shows a passing through crack. That's another very important uh, uh, feature uh, for structural engineering. Once you see the, a, a crack, you would like to, not always, you, you can understand if it's a passing through crack or not. Well, with thermography, <clears throat> just using, if there is a, it's a passing through, then uh, it must be a change in temperature somehow, or you can establish, you can force heat through or hot air through from the other side. If it's passing, then the, um, the fracture, along the line of the fracture, you will have an increase of temperature or vice versa. So it's a very handy way to establish also if a crack that is visible on one side of the wall and not necessarily is mirrored on the other side is indeed a pressing through crack or not. <clears throat> and then here you have a, the, you see a pendentive uh, and uh, that's the only way you could establish how this pendentive um, structure was uh, 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 remodeled, so to speak, um, in, uh, in the 18th century. And uh, this is the Hagia Sophia in, uh, in uh, Istanbul. And very, they were very happy about this type of uh, uh, understanding that thanks to thermography was able to do. Here you have a heat distribution related to humidity. Well, where is the humidity? You have a lower <clears throat> temperature. And uh, from uh, the floor, ground floor, all the way up, according to a color code that you can set up, <clears throat> you see how um, um, humidity, in this case, uh, it's, uh, it's a big problem all over the church. And um, it's coming from under the ground all the way up. Very straightforward way to say and to map humidity. And then you can do the same also on paintings uh, where you, uh, you want to check if the light system is heating up the surface or not. This is uh, the, the thermogram of uh, 15 minutes after where the light that, it was, that it was set on the painting was indeed sending up heat and creating an area of increasing heat. And, in, and more and more with time, this heat was uh, spreading all over the surface. Now you would expect this being done systematically in any museum, hardly is the case. So the effect of light and also people on paintings can be established, can be monitorized, can be uh, matched in time. Endoscopy, fiber, op fiber optics uh, endoscopy analysis, uh, it should be straightforward. But how many times, uh, uh, even in my country, they prefer to take down even big chunks of uh, mural paintings on the ceilings to see what happened and why it has cracked uh, or has, uh, was damaged rather than just sticking a, a very, sing, a, a very uh, small uh, four millimeters of fiber optics. And then radar investigation. Well, you, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all the, the radar, which is very fascinating and is sort of brand new technology we are trying to push forward. Uh, how to design a, a specific antenna for these purposes, and what kind of frequency we should be using, what kind of res uh, resolution we need. But the idea is to try to go through the wall, to go farther than just the surface that we can see with thermography and understand what is the inner structure uh, underneath the first layer uh, of the, uh, the wall structure. <clears throat> and uh, radar seems to be very promising in that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, hardly there's anyone uh, studying this problem for cultural heritage applications, by the way. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> Plenty of radar experts are, uh, are around, but uh, I would like to see some of them uh, challenged by these kind of problems. Um, we managed to see that there is a small void, vo a small cavity right under the, uh, the, the Vasari's panel uh, applied on the wall that Vasari, the uh, uh, Medici's architect, uh, set up. And we found this void only in a certain area of the, this, the, the entire huge hole that you've seen before. And probably it was Vasari who decided to leave this uh, cavity just to protect uh, the, the, the Bell of Anghiari, uh, Leonardo's masterpiece. Uh, and so that's encouraging. It's not a definite proof, but surely it's an indication. That's a layout of, uh, of the radar rendering, uh, which is uh, focusing uh, this um, red, red uh, <coughs> 
rectangle shows uh, an area with very high peaks in return right after roughly 14 centimeters uh, uh, after the, the front surface, indicating uh, some uh, very strong interface uh, which we, uh, we figure should be air since it's uh, just as uh, uh, the, the same type of signal that is being generated at the interface between air and mirror painting. <clears throat> And this should be the, the layout that probably uh, should have happened, the brick wall set up by Vasari and the cavity, and hopefully that would be the, the step prior to finding if the pigments are still buried there. Incidentally, the whole development gallery was considered, at the time of Leonardo in 1505, the biggest, most important masterpiece of its time, the school of the world. So we are not just talking about you know, a curiosity. <clears throat> and this is matching to uh, the uh, <clears throat> to exam. You have uh, the radar chart and showing uh, this uh, this uh, this sort of black stripe is a sewer main, and the same thing is being shown uh, uh, with thermography. I mean, I could go on and on. There are hundreds of other examples, but now let's concentrate, and I'll try to be even faster than I've been. But as you see, it's immense. The application is just everywhere and technology could fly on, on a, on a unknown uh, and unplowed uh, ground <clears throat> in any direction. So the Leonardo da Vinci investigation layout uh, was, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, an anamnesis and then scientific research divided in diagnostic imaging and analytical diagnostics. In diagnostic imaging, more or less, to some extent, we, we try to go even further in the medical world, in, with, with obviously with with obvious limitations, I should say, in other cases. For analytical diagnostics, we try to move in with portable units so that we go and we collect data, not only without um, necessarily have to take samples, but also where, they, where the work of art is located. Um, then uh, just very few, few lines about the history of this painting. In 1481, it was commissioned to Leonardo by, by friars of a monastery near Florence, and uh, after uh, that was in March, uh, just about at the turn of the next year, 1482, he left for, for Milano and he never came back to finish this painting. And frankly, people don't know exactly what happened to it, but we do know that 15 years later, the Friars Commission, uh, um, the artist, I mean, to Filippino Lippi, another adoration because, well, because they just wanted an adoration to set up on their main altar. So we know for sure that at least for that long of time, the adoration was indeed uh, <clears throat> uh, in the hands of the, of the, of the friars. Uh, and um, for some reason, there is a big gap between uh, 1481 and 1622, and we don't know what happened to it. There is some, there are just only one mentioned done by Vasari in his life of excellent uh, artist. Uh, that he thinks that, uh, he says that it should have been in, in a family's, uh, Benchy's family's, uh, uh, which were tied to the, to the monastery. But then only in 1621, we have the very first documents specifying that was, this painting was in the hands of the, um, of the Medici. Okay, so now let's move in and see, it's almost a square. It's made by 10 planks, popular planks. <clears throat> Oops, this is just a little too much. Okay. Uh, as you see, by the way, it's rather, you know, not exactly very regular, very precise. Um, so we try to make a model, again, a 3D model, we, because we believe that the first step uh, is to get the geometry of the object, if you want to study it properly, and if you want to compare in time, if you want to do any preventive conservation for the future. <clears throat> So either you stitch images or you take measurements, whatever is the case, but you need the geometry. That is a very simple fact that uh, is straightforward in a, in a science, a scientific, muse, a scientific environment, but surely is not in the in a museum environment or even uh, in uh, you know in, uh, in 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 the territory. Uh, so we have been trying to use. Uh, um, technology that already does exist for other fields. In this case, uh, a, a structured light just shining, a grid of light, a pattern of light first on a, on a, a known uh, geometry surface, and then uh, to compare uh, the, the same uh, pattern of light deformed by the geometry of this surface, in this case of the painting. 
And uh, we were able, therefore, to make a very nice 3D with a precision of 250 microns, a quarter of a millimeter. And that, for the future, we means that you can duplicate this exam and see what will happen uh, and where and possibly understand why, rather than just wait for pieces of paint to, to fall on the ground or to hear the cracks, just hear the cracks. That's uh, also still an indication when you have to move in and do something. Um, on top, of the, of, on top of, the, of the wood support, uh, hemp and linen fibers uh, were glued uh, just to uh, absorb some, uh, some of the mechanical movements of, uh, of this uh, big uh, setup of, of, uh, of planks. <clears throat> and then a gesso ground uh, was, uh, car was just put all over, um, of, all over the surface. Uh, so mm, with two layers of gesso gross to gesso fina, we can skip that. But the interesting part is that there were fibers also in the gesso ground, calcium sulfate, uh, again to, uh, to absorb some of the movement of this very big panel. This was quite unusual. You could find uh, fibers stuck on the, on the wood, but not necessarily fiber mixed with the, with the, um, in, in the ground. I think this is, was uh, good thinking. <clears throat> anyway, uh, we also established with scanning electron microscopy and uh, with microprobing uh, the, the nature of the, of the ground uh, indeed was calcium sulfate. Um, and then let me move on. We also established the, that these fibers were, some of them were colored. Uh, we found, uh, for example, chlorine, chlorine and uh, sodium uh, and other uh, chemi uh, um, chemical elements justifying uh, uh, that uh, Leonardo just took uh, uh, pieces of fabrics, uh, just shred uh, fibers uh, from fab fabrics and just mix it with, uh, with the gesso ground. Then we use X-ray fluorescence analysis with a portable unit to establish just to get an idea what kind of a chemi um, uh, what kind of a, uh, pigments uh, we could find and therefore what kind of chemical elements uh, could be associated. And we found lead just about everywhere. And the reason for all, for all this lead, even though it doesn't appear to be, since it's monochromatic, uh, you know, to have this uh, so much uh, uh, white in it, is because Leonardo has uh, used uh, a, a lead white priming over the preparation. But before doing so, he did a, a drawing, a very beautiful drawing that we will, we will be able to see shortly. And we were able with a Raymond, a micro Raymond, uh, Raymond spectroscopy uh, done just on, on, on that, uh, those very few granules uh, uh, just uh, covered by the priming layer uh, we were able to establish that the drawing was done with lamp black, uh, diluted with, um, with, uh, with glue. <clears throat> I mean, sorry, with glue diluted, very diluted. And then, as I said, the priming layer sitting on top, luckily, because so today we can see this wonderful drawing, has been protected. At the same time, Leonardo had in mind to uh, leave the visualization of the drawing, since it was covered by white, as a gray line. That was very another, I think, a great uh, a solution uh, that unfortunately could not follow through because, as I said, a few months later, he left and he never uh, did the painting as in terms of color. Uh, here is uh, another exam that shows uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, the priming was just pure lead white. And here you have just a, an outline of uh, the stratification analysis that uh, we were able to do, just taking extremely fine uh, samples and, uh, in, and and put it in resin and cut it and uh, see in the microscope in, in the reflected light and UV fluorescence and to see that the layout of the priming in some areas which were the top and the bottom areas were just uh, fine and touch and disturbed where in many other areas, mainly in the center part of the, of the, of the painting, this priming was totally um, disturbed, disrupted. And here you see chunks of, uh, of, of uh, <clears throat> of lead white just flying around, uh, mixed with, uh, with a top uh, um, uh, brown uh, layer of color. And it's very regular. It's like has been abraded. It's like has been uh, uh, subject to not only mechanical abrasion, but also being in touch with a solvent that has therefore um, dissolved uh, uh, the, the binding media. 
Uh, in, in addition, what we found are the top areas where the, the layer of the, of the priming was uh, undamaged, we found that the, uh, the cracks, uh, the aging cracks uh, formed during time uh, of the uh, priming layer and the preparation layer. Inside those cracks, the paint that we see today was sinking in. See? As if, as we see here, see? That's the, that's the brown, uh, <clears throat> dark brown layer of the, of the leaves. They are sinking in uh, the, uh, these, these layers. The next one uh, is still visible the same way. And I think I have another one. Look how clear that is. In other words, uh, the preparation and the priming were done at a certain time. That they had the time to crack. They had the time, therefore, to dry. And later on, a pretty long time later, the paint was added. So before the painting was done, the surface was already damaged and was already dried. So the painting is not contemporary to the drawing. Then multispectral diagnostic imaging was done. And here I'm going to show you finally a layout, uh, well, some, I would say, staggering results uh, not due to me or to anybody who has uh, worked with me, but just the fact that applying the right methodology, applying the right technology to be able to go through and see, once we have established that the painting, by the way, is not done by Leonardo, and this is, uh, it took me just about four years to get it through uh, the art historian's world. It was not exactly you know, a walk in the park when I presented this for the first time. Um, as you can imagine, I mean, after all, we talk about the most important painting of Leonardo we have in Italy. And to say, well, look, this, Leonardo never painted it, is not a, a very easy statement to make. If you still want to, want to work in, uh, in the environment of cultural heritage, no matter where you go. <clears throat> so, uh, just to give you an idea that it's not necessarily a very easy life. Um, <clears throat> okay. Let's see, for example, a detail of the top left part of the painting. And this is a, this is much brighter um, than the original one, but I, I wanted to show you, otherwise it would have looked just dark. But now we go through, we see through uh, with the infrared imaging, <clears throat> and that's the layout out of all the, the figures, the workers that are indeed working on over there. Uh, see this area, for example, uh, there is nothing here. Uh, to the visible eye. Uh, but what does it say? It's not just a curiosity. Well, it changes the iconography, but also it changes the iconology because they are workers. In other words, they're not just a bunch of ruins, but the ruins are being restored. You are building a new temple on top of the old one. Uh, these are details and which shows motion, but also shows a lot of uh, very uh, I mean, at many attempts uh, to find the best um, position of each figure. In other words, you also understand that the drawing was done, was created for the first time on the panel, on the preparation. It was not a transposed drawing. So what we see over 70 figures, we see Leonardo at work for the first time. And this is a very big revelation. Uh, also, we see how many changes is introduced always finding the right, <clears throat> the right position. Uh, here, check in the middle of the forehead, there is another eye right here. Uh, or this area here, this whole area, you can find a very nice uh, elephant walking by. Um, and what does it do there? Well, this is the, is the epiphany representation. It's not just the adoration. So you have the Magi coming to uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> to Jesus, uh, to the baby Jesus. And uh, so the elephant is seen so small because it's in the background. There are many uh, planes, so to speak. Uh, and this is a, is, a, is a story, therefore, being told in time but also in space. But all this brownish stuff just covered everything and didn't, and didn't allow us to see or anyone to understand what indeed were the intentions of Leonardo. So um, this is another... Example, also the manger uh, practically was not, hardly was visible. And see the next 
this is the elephant with this little guy on top. Incidentally, there's not another elephant around uh, done by Leonardo. So it's also, this could be a curiosity if you want, but it makes sense in terms of size. But as you can see, it's practically invisible to the naked eye because the intention of this unknown artist was to cover it, not to paint. That's very important to establish. So it was to cover uh, um, themes, uh, figures, subjects that either were not finished or were not supposed to be seen. Now, this is not a mystery for Dan Brown book. Don't get me wrong. We will have an explanation for that. <clears throat> See, for example, the ox and the donkey, how beautiful they are, and they were just totally hidden. And I can assure you that if you go there, you don't even see this well with the naked eye. Now, this is a, it's a wonderful set of uh, figures that hardly now are visible. But look, the, 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 um, the layout of this uh, portraits, it's a masterpiece, each of them, uh, that uh, reveal finally to us. So as, as we, we do justice to Leonardo, we are using technology to understand his masterpieces. I think he would have been happy about that. <clears throat> see these wonderful portraits. Uh, would never be able to see it. See, each of one is a discovery. It's a work of art on its own. Or see this uh, just flat, brownish ground. Never intended to be so. This is not the work of Leonardo. That's what he, he left us. This wonderful layout of stones, as you can find in the birth uh, of, and the baptism of, um, of Christ by Verrocchio and Leonardo, by the way. <clears throat> Here is a curiosity, not that much, but shows you also the intention of this unknown artist, by the way, very bad artist, um, to also change the physiognomy and the positions of some of these uh, figures. I show you, maybe you might follow the, <clears throat> the pointer. This is not the, the real nose profile. The original nose, this is the original nose. That's the nostril. That's the upper lip, the lower lip, and the chin and the beard. You see that? That's the nose, the nostril, and the, the mouth and the beard. Okay, or see here how the hands were practically sort of cut like you would do with paperwork, you know, uh, just covered. And uh, I remember I was told by the director, the former director of the Uffizi that, that she was very happy to see this, believe me, um, because she said, well, finally, we stopped talking about the uh, geometric Leonardo, Leonardo Geometrico. Uh, because they couldn't figure out why, you know, the profiles of the hands of the feet were so, uh, quote unquote, uh, not anatomically correct and almost, uh, you know, so sharp in the edges. Well, no wonder, because uh, a painter later just decided to, well, to contour them in a very lousy way. <clears throat> and then finally, the, the battle scene, which, by the way, sits on top of, uh, of, um, uh, of the Madonna. This is a wonderful exhibition. This is a wonderful, per se, it's a wonderful picture. Uh, you see um, maybe better here, uh, comparing the visible light to the invisible, you see a lot of motion. Several positions of the right, of the right um, arm, uh, the same of the legs. You talking about the legs, look how the legs, inter in, uh, they, they just uh, sort of fight each other. They in <clears throat> um, trying to, uh, as if they were themselves uh, in, at war. Uh, the right hand rider, two heads of the, of the, of the horse, and then uh, several, two positions of the left leg, several positions of, uh, of the rear legs, uh, an interesting, beautiful head of a horse right here. This is all emotion. This was the first time that all this was in motion. Never before we have an example of this kind of motion. So it was a revolution per se. Now, uh, the final three shots, I'd like to, to call in uh, John Graham, uh, who is a researcher at the San Diego State University and at Cal IT too, uh, just to show you what he has done just recently to help me out to understand uh, and to show you at the same time uh, a better understanding of why Leonardo could have 
left. <clears throat> Now, first we see uh, the painting as we would see it going to the Uffizi with, uh, with our eyes, and then we fade in, with a, in, a, in the infrared <clears throat> imaging, um, and you see much better in an overall picture of all this man at work. Now here, again, remember one of the, of the many reasons why he could have left the painting unfinished is that he introduced motion just about everywhere. I mean, not only tangled, a lot of people just uh, talking, moving, having expressions, uh, but also even uh, the idea of rebuilding uh, this temple uh, might have been not well accepted by the friars. But let's go and see another one. Uh, go to the visible. See that this is the only place probably in the world where you can see this in such a, with such quality. Don't take it for granted, by the way. I never seen it myself before. So this is thanks to not only uh, Dr. Ramesh, but also CalIT, the, the enormous uh, technological potentiality that I found here. <clears throat> okay, slide in. And here we have a not just a skirmish of two riders. We have a war, a real war, with a lot of people wounded, dead, just um, getting on the, on the ground. And this is not exactly what you would expect on the adoration painting. A lot of figures moving, a, a, bloody, a deadly war, a very bloody one. And finally, go ahead, the third one, first the visible. And then uh, we go and see the Madonna, and it's not exactly the sacred family picture that you would expect in the adoration. Adoration, let's remember, is something static with the figures that are just adoring, that's why it's called adoration, uh, the birth of, uh, of Jesus. And where is St. John? It's not part of the sacred family. So I could add more and more uh, reasons, but let's assume simply for it, <clears throat> that Leonardo abandoned because it was too advanced, it was too new, and in a way, his um, um, some of his um, um, <clears throat> subjects were too. I don't want to say blasphemous, no, but let's say surely it was not very. They were not accepted as a typical adoration theme theme to be put on the main altar of a church. Uh, let's remember we are talking back for. At, you know, way back 1481, uh, people were not exactly so open-minded, especially on these theological themes, as today they are talking about Dan Brown, they, they discuss about or the, about everything, as long as uh, <clears throat> this very smart art, uh, writer gets richer and richer. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah.